inshallah ta'ala, we are finishing the tafsir of Surah Muhammad. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and his blessings upon his messenger Muhammad and to make us amongst those who are following in his footsteps until the end of times. Allahumma ameen. And then we're going to do a summary, like a story-like summary, compiling all of the principles that are important for you to benefit, inshallah ta'ala, personal, uh, basically, principles of happiness and success, as well as for the entire ummah. These are crucial, and they're all extracted from just one surah. So let's start with ayah 31. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ We will certainly test you, O believers. حَتَّى نَعْلَمَ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَنَبْلُوَ أَخْبَارَكُمْ Until we prove, meaning until it's shown, it's distinguished amongst you, who truly struggles in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who remains steadfast, and you reveal how you basically conduct yourself. Now, who can remind us, for those who are paying very close attention in tafsir, where else was this word mentioned in the surah? When was it used? وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ who remembers? Who can tell us in which ayah? That we will test you. The concept of being tested. So not necessarily an exact uh, form like this, but the concept of being tested. This was mentioned early on in the surah. Jazakum khairan. Ayah 4. Jazakum khairan. Rahimah. May Allah subhanahu bless you and reward you. Ayah 31 is where we're currently at. Ahmed, barakallahu feek. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this as well in the very beginning. So in this surah, we're talking about uh, tests here in two different ways. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have taken care of people of evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can just say be, and it is. But there is a test in this world. And this reminds us of that test. And so you're tested in terms of what? Stopping evil in the world or uh, bringing about goodness in the world or being uh, righteous in this world. That is part of the test. In this case, the context, of course, is that the disbelievers are attacking the believers. The people of uh, Quraysh, the pagans, are uh, about to uh, basically engage in a battle with the Muslim community. So this test, this particular test, is going to distinguish who really is willing to strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this case, it is talking about the jihad uh, that is physical of uh, the, the battlefield in terms of the battle of Badr. And as well, wasabirin, those who are patient, those who persevere, those who endure. What is the wisdom here that is clar that, that's clarified to us? And how does this help us mentally or emotionally? What is the wisdom in this? How does this help us mentally and emotionally in terms of the notion of the test? How does this help us? Can someone tell us in what way might this be helpful to someone mentally, emotionally, psychologically? The notion of being tested to distinguish, to distinguish people. And of course, we're distinguishing for ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. So what is the benefit here emotionally or mentally? Who can tell us, inshallah ta'ala? And of course, uh, an emphasis here, the silence of the ummah in times of hardship prevents it from being upon the truth, meaning it won't lead to anything good. It's important that people are always striving and speaking up and addressing the truth wherever it may be. The way that this might help us emotionally or mentally. Jazakum khairan. Barakallahu Excellent responses, mashallah. So number one, okay, it brings comfort that our struggles are a test, not a punishment. Excellent. Jazakum khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa reward you. This is true. It keeps you strong. Okay, it keeps you strong, gives you resilience. It's absolutely true. There is uh, something that it's linked to in uh, theology and philosophy. Um, uh, our Musa, sorry, I, I just see the first letter. Always have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent, excellent, that's true. It will get you through any times, absolutely. It reminds you of the nature of the dunya that all people experience. That's correct, Hazim, jazakallah khairan. Training for the upcoming test, that's true as well. So this reminds us about the question of suffering. Why does hardship exist in this world? A lot of people, of course, struggle with this because they have the wrong expectations about a dunya and the wrong ideas of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That they expect in their minds, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say be, and it is. Kun fayakun. Yeah, Allah addresses that in this very surah. Walakin li yablu wa ba wa kum Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have taken care of these people and stopped all evil from, uh, basically from people doing any evil things in this world. People who choose to use their free will the wrong way. They're not passing the test, obviously. They're using it to violate the rights of other people, to hurt other people. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have stopped that. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here, and there's, this is uh, part of the uh, response to the, the people who struggle theologically and philosophically, which then leads to an emotional struggle that they don't understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us with our free will. That is the, the entirety of the purpose of our existence on earth, that we are being tested with our free will. And it is to distinguish those who will keep striving and those who will be patient and those who will persevere from those who don't. And so Al-Fulayl bin Iyad, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars from the first generations, when he recited this ayah one time, it was reported that he started to cry and then he made dua. And the dua is translated as, oh Allah, do not afflict us. Don't test us, ya Allah. And if we are... Uh, afflicted, then it's going to expose us in terms of our shortcomings and our weaknesses, and our uh, hidden faults will be exposed or destroyed. In other words, Ya Allah, please don't test us. Ya Allah, please don't test us. Ya Allah, please don't test us. Because with a verse like this, it's reminding us that the Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will purify, filter out um, uh, the believers as well in terms of the hardships that they experience. Now, of course, if I were to say, that the uh, test here is uh, every Muslim is told, just pray. That's it. There's nothing else. Just salah. That in itself is already a test, as you see all around the world. It's a test for many people. That some people are not even doing that. They're not striving in terms of jihad and nafs against their own nafs to pray, for example, to wear hijab, to fast Ramadan. Those are just some examples because it is a jihad. It's not easy. So it's telling us that there are multiple types of tests on different levels. And each test will bring out some of the goodness of some individuals who strive harder and some of the weaknesses of others. And the tests get harder and harder. The objective, of course, and the hope is that we are as strong as we hope that we are. But this is why Al-Fudayl cried when he recited this ayah, because it is a purification as well. It's going to purify. It's going to distinguish those who really are striving hard. So Allah, do not afflict us with hardships. Allah, do not afflict us with hardships. Allah, do not afflict us with hardships. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not test you with something you not you cannot handle, but it doesn't mean that you will handle it. You have the potential to pass that test, but it doesn't mean that you will. That's where the, the free will comes in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Allah help us to praise you often, to remember you often, to worship you in the best manner possible. One of the scholars said, through trials and difficult times. The hardworking person is distinguished from other people who might be lazier. The truthful is distinguished from the liar. The good is distinguished from the one who is evil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us in all situations. Allahumma alim. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those who try once again to hinder others. Inna kafaru in the next ayah. Wa saddu an sabilillah. And they hinder others. Where did you see this earlier in the surah? Who can tell us? Those who disbelieve, wa saddu an sabilillah. Do you, do you remember where you saw this in Surah Muhammad? Those who reject the truth and they hinder others from the path of Allah and they defy the messenger after guidance was made clear to them. They're not going to harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. They cannot harm Allah. But rather their deeds was sayuhbitu a'malahum. Their deeds are rendered nullified, void. Jazakum khair, sister Rahima. Ayah 1 is correct. Alladheena kafaru wa saddu an sabila. The very opening of this surah. Similar uh, wording here. There's a reminder for us. Uh, these people who turn away might think, or at least the pagans thought they were harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some way or harming the messenger because they didn't support Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of us. So no matter how much somebody disobeys Allah, they're not harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're harming themselves. They're harming themselves with their actions and they will regret that harm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. It's a type of self-oppression. And then the, this brings us to a principle, the principle of obedience, the principle of obedience. So for those who are writing notes and you're writing down and noting what are the principles mentioned in this surah, there is another principle here. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O believers, atli'u Allah wa atli'u rasul wa la tuqilu a'malakum. O believers, obey Allah and obey the messenger and do not allow your deeds to be in vain, to be basically wasted. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu is mentioned in the Quran 89 times, 89 times I believe. And 89 times here, meaning every time you read it, you come across it, pay closer attention. Pay very close attention. Brothers and sisters, if you had to grade yourself on how much you hear and obey, how much you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
what would you, what grade would you give yourself? This is a private question. Don't, don't answer. It's rhetorical. Think about how the angels who are, of course, infallible, they're only doing what they are commanded, right? They hear and they obey. And the rest of the creation hears and obeys, except for the creation that has free will, except for the creation that has free will, meaning the ability to choose. When you do an act of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding you here, obey Allah, but don't cause your deeds to be in vain, to be wasted. So don't keep bringing it up. Don't do something nice to someone and then keep bringing it up to other people. Protect your good deeds. Guard your deeds. Don't ruin them by expecting something else from people. And an activity for us here is to think about one act of worship that you are struggling with. You can write this down if you're writing notes. Think of one act of worship that you are struggling with. Something you've tried to implement numerous times and you keep struggling with. Or something, something that is uh, prohibited and you keep falling into it and you want to try to overcome it. There are many different things, of course, we can suggest and advise, but just so we're utilizing this eye in a very specific way, keep re repeating in your mind and on your tongue, oh Allah, I hear and I obey. I hear and I obey. I hear and I obey. When you think about this frequently, you'll find inshallah ta'ala with different acts of worship, some support, a reminder, some motivation. Allah, wa atiyah rasul. Obedience to the Messenger وسلم, is because he is teaching what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And the Prophet وسلم, would never teach anything, religiously at least, would never teach anything that is not part of the faith, would never uh, talk about something that's not part of Islam when it comes to revelation. When it comes to worldly matters, that's different. But when it comes to revelation, when it comes to teaching Islam, when it comes to prohibitions, the, the Prophet وسلم, is uh, commanded to do that, and we are commanded to follow and obey Allah and his Messenger. This is also uh, on a side note here, a response to those who reject hadith and they are a small movement and they are not really following any methodology, any usul, anything like that. They're following their desires. They're not consistent. It's not logical. It contradicts the Quran. This is one of the ayat that, in fact, is a response against them. Obeying the Messenger وسلم, requires us, long after the Messenger وسلم, to be able to see what he said and what he uh, taught and his actions, his life, his history, وسلم, which is the uh, process of uh, taking authenticated uh, hadith. So the principle here is a principle of obedience. Uh, for many people, as we are, you know, alhamdulillah, completing the month of Ramadan, many people are, are looking to push themselves, keep reflecting on this ayah. Oh Allah, I hear and I obey. Oh Allah, I hear and I obey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who obey him consistently. Allahumma ameen. Ayah 34. Those who disbelieve and they hinder others from the path of Allah, and then they die as disbelievers, Allah will never forgive them. It's a really, really, really heavy ayah. Allah will never forgive them. Where else did we see similar wording to this? Somebody already answered this. We saw in ayah 1, and then we saw in the previous ayah, ayah 32. The, the emphasis on those who disbelieve and they turn others from the truth. This is the third time it's mentioned in that way. Why? The pagans would mock Islam, harass the Muslims, would even uh, uh, take all the measures that they could when people are visiting Mecca to tell them, don't follow Islam. They'll spread propaganda. There are people like that in the world today. They may have struggled with Islam at one point, And then due to their arrogance, they left. And then they started discouraging others from following Islam. What is the frightening part of this ayah? What is the frightening part of this? That Allah will never forgive them. What is the frightening part of this? Who can tell us? And then I'm going to ask, what is the glad tiding in this? What is the frightening part of this ayah? Allah will never forgive them. Who can tell us? They will never enter Jannah. This is correct. It's an absolute statement. No way out of it. Yes. No second chance for them. Well, this is referring to the day of judgment. So they can't start to believe. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good guess. But everyone in this world who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given that chance. The frightening part of this is that once a person dies, and if they are amongst these people, they rejected the truth. 
and they turned others away from it. I mean, the message was clear to them. They turned away from it and they died in a state of kufr. They don't have access to forgiveness on the day of judgment. And that's a really frightening thought. They don't have that opportunity anymore. This is their chance to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're given what? Two chances, three chances, a million chances. Every opportunity, every reminder, every day they wake up. It's another opportunity to turn back to Allah, turn back to Allah, turn back to Allah. What is the glad tiding part of this? Well, part of this is a glad tiding for the believers. But what part of this might be glad tiding for the believers? Falan yalfir Allah is about disbelievers. What might be the glad tiding here? Who can tell us? Excellent. Jazakumul khairan, Akhi Ahmed. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the believers for their shortcomings. That there is hope that anything, anything other than kufr and shirk has a chance of being forgiven on the day of judgment. So there's a chance that many of the sins that the believers commit, there's some hope. Maybe they did other good deeds that will cause these to be erased. Maybe they will be uh, interceded for. Maybe it's because of a specific act of worship, dua, sadaqah that they gave, uh, the Quran they memorized that will cause some of their sins to be erased on that day. So the glad tiding part of this is that this is referring specifically to kufr, to those who reject the truth. And so everything beneath that and uh, other ayat as well, in Allah Allah does not forgive the one who commits shirk, meaning after death. This ayah clarifies that for us. So it is Quran, uh, tafsir of the Quran by the Quran. But anything below that or beneath that in terms of the believers themselves, uh, we hope there's some way that some of those sins will be erased. Does it mean some believers will not be punished Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there is a punishment for certain major sins on the day of judgment. So no, of course, you, we should be afraid of those uh, consequences and do what we're required to do. But the hope here is that there's still, there's still some chance of some things being forgiven on the day of judgment for the one who did not die upon disbelief. So at least, at least there's a reminder here, hold on, hold on, hold on to one's faith, no matter how difficult things get. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in ayah 35, this is in the context of war, the battle of Badr that's coming up. Do not falter or ask or cry for peace. For you will have the upper hand and Allah is with you. And he will never let your deeds go to waste. There's a really important repetition happening in the surah. I think some of you may have noticed up to this point. But first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. So do not falter. Don't get weak. Don't give up. Remind yourself with the following words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. Allah is protecting me. Allah is watching over me. Allah is merciful to me. Remember these words and keep repeating them no matter the situation that you're in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not cause you to be uh, wasted in terms of your deeds, to be left alone. He is with you so long as you turn to him so long as you're holding on strong. Now, there's a reminder here for the believers. In one context, they were going to the battle of Badr, uh, meaning this would be useful for the battle of Badr, but also for the believers in general. Be strong, be strong, be strong till the very end, meaning don't give up. And likewise in life, be strong, be strong, be strong, and do not give up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. Wallahu ma'akum, wallahu ma'akum, wallahu ma'akum. Why do we need that reminder? Someone might say, well, I already know that. Well, you're going to need that reminder more when things get difficult. You're going to need that reminder when there's a really tough situation. And then somebody starts telling you, are you tested in your faith? And you're like, no, Allah is still with me. Allah is with me. I'm positive. I'm convinced. And nobody, nothing can take that conviction away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that conviction, that yaqeen, Allahumma ameen. Don't ever think that you are weak because of something physical or because of your own situation. Rather, give yourself a boost of confidence in knowing that you are strong because Allah is with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. You are strong. You are strong because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. Now, what is the part of this ayah that's been repeated throughout the surah so many times? What part of this verse did you notice? There's a repetition. Same thing being mentioned in different forms throughout the surah. Throughout the surah. We haven't commented on it in detail yet, but here it is. What part of this ayah? Not letting your deeds go to waste. Excellent. So, in terms of deeds, in terms of your, your deeds, your actions, 
This is being mentioned throughout the surah, in fact, from literally the very first ayah. Their deeds go to waste, they're void, nullified. So here's what we see in the surah, and I, I listed them here. Ayah 1 and number 8, number 9, 28, and 32. All of those verses, those five verses, are about the disbelievers' deeds being what? Wasted. There's one ayah, ayah 4, about the believers' deeds not being void. And then you have another emphasis here as well. 33, 34, 35, they're all about your deeds, right here. In the last ayah is about those who die upon kufr, meaning nothing will be accepted. In the ayah before that, 33, right? 32, 33, and 35 right here, all about the, uh, the, the, the acts of worship, the deeds themselves. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates your efforts and he's reminding you that your efforts and your good deeds are preserved and they will not be nullified. So don't do anything to put them at risk. Don't do anything to put your deeds at risk. Can you imagine somebody investing so much money in a stock? So much money. Like this person just came across, let's say, a billion dollars. May Allah bless us all with rizq so we can give for his sake and be grateful. Servants, Allahumma ameen. Can you imagine somebody gave you a billion dollars? And then you gave like people access to your passwords. Go ahead and log into my account. No security whatsoever. You're clicking on all these links that come to you, opening up viruses and malware and everything else. You're not guarding that thing which is precious to you. Your deeds that you work so hard on for the akhirah, don't allow anything to take that away. Don't allow insincerity to waste it. Don't keep bringing it up. Don't expose your private good deeds to other people. So don't do anything that will put your good deeds at risk, that will jeopardize your deeds and know that Allah appreciates every single thing that you do and it will count you're not wasting your time or wasting your life and on this note you find many people oftentimes when they're still in the early phases of knowing Islam and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes youth will struggle with this they'll see other people chasing after dunya and being super successful with worldly things sometimes it's not even real success but it's like a worldly notion of success Right. And they're like, man, I wish I could do that. Man, these people have so much. Man, these people are so lucky. Man, their lifestyles are so cool. And they start following them. They start watching them. They start watching, you know, TV shows, clips, social media, like looking up to these people. Look at what they have. Look at how they live life. I wish I could do that. No, I have to be this. I have to do that. I have to pray. I have to follow rules. Your deeds are not wasted. Theirs are. Your deeds are not wasted. Theirs are nullified. And I'm talking here about people who reject the truth when it comes to them specifically. So focus on the value of your deed because on the day of judgment, that is the most precious currency that you have. There's nothing more valuable than that from a dunya that you can take to your grave, except your good deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in good deeds. Allahumma ameen. You're building for a life in which those deeds are worth so much more, so much more. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, and this is the last principle that we will cover uh, inshallah ta'ala. And actually, we could add one more principle to this. There's a bonus here. For those who remember in the very beginning, we mentioned we'll cover at least 10 principles in this surah. This is the 11th principle. It's about the reality of life. It's a reminder because sometimes you're looking at other people and saying, you know what? I wish I could do what they're doing. I wish I could chase their lifestyles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna mal hayatu dunya wa la. This worldly life is no more than play and amusement. But if you are faithful and mindful of Allah, you have taqwa, Allah will grant you your full reward and he will not ask you to donate all of your wealth. The context here, the battle of Badr, when the believers had to go, of course, some of them were giving uh, sadaqah or rather a donation here for uh, the, the battle that was about to take place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, this life is the lowly life, al hayatul dunya. Ad dunya means what? the thing that is low and close, the thing that is close to you or the thing that is low. So here's the principle or here's a reminder. This life is low. So don't stoop to its level. Focus on the akhirah. It's lasting. It's lasting. It's lasting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the akhirah our greater concern. Allahumma ameen. The lives of many celebrities, politicians, sports players, just famous people and others, are followed and their endings as well, how they live their lives, how they died. And some people spend so much time in that kind of gossip and no benefit whatsoever. There's no benefit in that kind of amusement. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our time with that which is beneficial. Here's a question, a general one. Let's get some quick answers, inshallah. 
what are some common things that we might see today that are considered a form of amusement in people's lives that are wasteful, that are wasteful? It's no more than play and, and amusement. May Allah protect us. Music, okay, social media. Oh yeah, a lot of people are amused by social media, following a number of different pages, wasting a lot of time, this is true. And other people are using it in the right way, mashallah. Video games, TV shows, drinking, excellent responses. A lot of people uh, basically hold on to these things as a lifestyle, right? Uh, drinking, partying, or uh, maybe playing video games all day and night. Um, people are just constantly uh, obsessed with social media, music, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, video streaming services. So for many people, all they're doing is chasing after or spending a lot of time uh, on these different forms of amusement that are not rewarding at all. Now, I want you to ask yourself a question. This is for you personally, inshallah ta'ala. So as you're writing notes, take this part seriously because it may help you later on, inshallah ta'ala. Ask yourself honestly, amongst the things that you are doing in your life today, what would you consider to be a form of lahu, distraction and amusement that's, that's taking away from something more important this is for yourself so you can inshallah focus on overcoming this one thing or two things inshallah ta'ala what in your life you would you consider to be laib and lahu play and distraction or amusement this is distracting you from something else alhaqum takathur lahu in the quran alhaqum uh, takathur in the beginning of uh, surah takathur is that you've been uh, basically amused or distracted by a takathur, to have a lot more of something. Takathur here is usually also in the sense that you are mutually competing to have more of something. The people are in competition. So they're chasing after dunya and looking at what other people have and trying to basically go up that uh, worldly ladder, right? Just building, building, building for a dunya and it doesn't have an end. There's no end in, in sight or in mind. So ask yourself what you're being distracted from and what's distracting you. Because if you can pinpoint at least one thing in Chalatana today for yourself, then perhaps that's something you can start to be more aware of, conscious of. When it comes up, you know what? I'm being distracted. Let me get back on track to something of much greater priority. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the believers, Allah is not asking you to put forth all of your wealth. No, you're going to live your life and take a share of what you need to survive for your family and others. But when there's an important cause, support that cause. When there's an important cause, support that cause. It is a test for you, but don't be attached to this life. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to continue with this ayah 37. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to do so and pressure you to give everything that you have, many people would withhold, withhold and then they would have some resentment, meaning they would struggle. They would be exposed in some kind of resentment that they have. Because why? It would be an extreme, extreme, extreme test. To give up all of one's wealth, what are you going to be left with in other words? And then here is the finale of the surah, ayah 38. And our final principle. So we have two bonus principles that we covered in the surah. Uh, the 11th one was about the, uh, the purpose of life and the uh, distractions and the amusement of life. Don't be distracted. And the last one here is an invitation to success. An invitation to success. Here you are being invited to donate a little in the cause of Allah. And this is, this is a reminder for some of the people who were there who heard this, who this came down uh, for, and yet some of you, some of you withhold your stingy. Whoever is stingy, they are only harming themselves. Whoever is greedy, they only cause loss to themselves. Why? Allah is self-sufficient, whereas you're the ones who stand in need of him. And if you turn away, if you turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will replace you with another people and they will not be like you. Ya Allah, this is a really heavy ayah. First, there's an invitation to success, which is when the opportunity arises to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The context here was very specific, but of course we take this and apply it to our lives today that we don't want to be stingy and hurt ourselves. Whoever is greedy, whoever holds back when it comes to that thing which doesn't even belong to them, whoever holds back, they're only harming themselves. And so the charity that you give to people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you believe as a believer, you believe with full conviction 
that you're going to be the one who's most in need of it on the day of judgment, not in this world. You're going to be more in need of it on the day of judgment, not in this world. And anytime someone's about to give in charity online or at a masjid, at an event, and then they kind of like, they, they hesitate and they retreat and they say, you know what, I'm not going to donate. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. And they try to distract themselves with something else. They have to recognize that they are not uh, being stingy against the poor necessarily, but rather they're being stingy against themselves. And of course, yes, they are preventing somebody who's in need, but they're harming themselves at the end of the day. And this is a really frightening uh, finale to the surah. If you turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with the people who will not be like you. And our religion, Islam, this beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not limited to a skin color or a language or a, a specific uh, place in the world, ethnicity-wise or anything like that. Whoever is carrying the mission of Islam forward and being strong with it and being sincere and they're following it correctly has the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds those who turn away from that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can replace such an individual or a group with other people. And so we want to make dua all the time by saying, oh Allah, utilize us and don't replace us. Allahumma sta'amilna wa la tastabdilna. Oh Allah, utilize us. Don't replace us. If you find yourself doing acts of worship, and right now this Ramadan, you find yourself doing more, you're obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you and he blessed you by his bounty and his mercy. So make that dua once again. Oh Allah, utilize us and don't replace us. Allah musta'amilna wa la tastabdilna. There are people who are given opportunities and they reject them, they turn away from them. And remember that anytime an opportunity comes for charity and you are able to give and you don't, just remember, others will be chosen to do that act of worship and rewarded for it and you would be prevented from it. So push yourself to take any opportunity, even literally, we always remind people, even if it's a dollar, five dollars, as long as it's a good cause, it's something that's uh, beneficial and you're able to, something small and simple to show, Ya Allah, I'm taking every opportunity that comes my way. And remember this as well. This ayah came down to whom? This, this ayah spoke to the companions first and foremost. They were there at that time. So how about us? Let us never wrongfully or pridefully assume that our lack of worship or our disobedience to Allah or the lack of service to his deen is a problem for the deen. It's a problem for us. It's a problem for us. And the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards Allah and Islam does not revolve around names and individuals of people. Rather, if you leave what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you is good, Allah will replace you with somebody else who is deserving of it. And if Allah blesses you with an opportunity to do good, be grateful and accept that opportunity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, this surah has so many things we can implement to change our lives and the state of the ummah today. And again, I know we cover this in a very summarized way. We could unpack every one of these principles and give its own full one hour, two hour session. But it's important for us to start somewhere. And I believe this is a, a great introduction to these principles that we are in need of for our lives and for the ummah. But there's a powerful summary here. And there's also a link between the opening and the closing of this surah. The opening of the surah begins with what? Uh, basically the, the disgrace of the disbelievers who are the pagans who are attacking the Muslims, rejecting the truth, turning others away from it. Their deeds are nullified and their sins have increased. And then you fast forward throughout the surah and you find what at the very end of the surah, once again, there's another disgrace here that's being mentioned for the one who turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who also don't support the truth when it's there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and it reminds us about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a very frightening ending may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us grateful and guide us and make us amongst those who take the opportunities that come to us Allahumma ameen I'm going to mention the 12 principles in case anyone missed them the first principle and if anybody here has notes that are typed up and you want to share them with everyone else feel free to do that the first principle from ayah 7 Give victory to the rights of Allah. Aid the religion of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid you. The second was ayah 11. Recognition of your protector. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is your protector. The third was about guidance versus desire worship. Different ideologies in this world. 
Just remember there are people who follow their desires and they take it as a God without realizing that's their religion. The believers distinguished from that. Your desires are channeled, in fact, towards the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth is paradise as the final destination. Keep your eyes on the prize. Number five, and that was ayah 15. Number five is ayah 17, increased guidance. Guaranteed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more guidance and taqwa if you seek guidance. The next one is ayah 18. The afterlife is near. The indications, the signs of the day of judgment. So what are you waiting for? What is it that you are waiting for? Do not procrastinate. Next one is number 19. Verse 19 about knowledge, education, knowledge, raising the bar and the standard for our ummah will change us and change the ummah as well. The ripple effects you might not see instantly. It might take 10, 20, 50, or 100 years, but it will have its impact. Our ummah is in need of reviving Islamic knowledge and connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next one is ayah 22. It's about family, preserving the unit of the family and having unity, avoiding divisions on multiple levels, reconciling between the hearts of people. It's uh, considered a form of evil to split up and divide the families. May Allah protect us all. The next one is ayah 24 about reflecting on the Quran. This is your worldview. This is your gift. This is your guidance, your morality, your justice, your comfort, your resilience, your strength, your happiness, your friend, your companion. It is the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do they not reflect on the Quran or are there locks on their hearts? May Allah protect us. The next one is Ayah 33. It's about obedience. That's the one we covered today. Obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It leads to success. The next one is Ayah 36 about play and amusement. Do not be distracted in this world with the overconsumption of leisure. And the last one is 38, an invitation from Allah. So go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how will we summarize, summarize all of this as one lengthy advice? So if I had to put this in one form of advice, and uh, the order is not the same as the one that I just gave you in terms of the ayat, one uh, lengthy advice, inshallah ta'ala. Here's, here's a, a, an advice with the 12 principles embedded into it. Know the truth. Know la ilaha illallah and live upon it. And then put in the effort, put in the effort, put in the effort and what's going to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you and Allah will elevate your ranks. And it's not always going to be easy, but obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the key to success. Throughout your journey, keep your eyes on the prize constantly. And that is the prize of paradise. And while seeking Allah's pleasure, keep your family ties strong and do not support the destruction of the family unit. When you are struggling to stay on the straight path, you will find a link between your spiritual state and your relationship to the Quran. Your relationship with the Quran will help you in times of hardships and difficulties. So stay connected to it. Your heart will be protected and liberated as well, rather than shackled and oppressed. And of course, in life, you are going to encounter people who reject the truth. And they will work hard to turn others away as well. And people who oppose you and people who may even harm you or your loved ones or the believers around the world. These are individuals who worship their desires rather than worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they try to justify the rejection of the truth with every excuse they can possibly come up with. But remember, Allah is your protector. And that such individuals have deeds that are nullified and rejected. So stay strong for your deeds are not wasted. In fact, your very strength and your success will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you hold on to the rights of Allah and you support the truth. Those who turn away from the truth and they are stingy are harming only themselves and they cannot harm Allah. And those who turn away from the truth after it has been made clear to them, Allah will replace them with a more deserving people. Do not procrastinate doing good, brothers and sisters, or think that you have a long time to go in this world, for the signs of the hour are near, and your own departure may take place at any time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not cause any of your good deeds to go to waste, so increase in goodness while you still have life in order to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good state. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet him in a good state and make the best of our days the day that we meet him. May Allah forgive us for all of our shortcomings and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be transformed through these principles and to transform others through them and to raise our children upon them and our communities as well. And we ask Allah to bless the ummah with a return to these principles so that we see better days by his mercy and by his bounty. Brothers and sisters, jazakumullahu khaira. This concludes the tafsir of Surah Muhammad. I ask Allah to accept from all of you to reward you immensely with all that you've put forth of effort 
And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for shortcomings, especially in these final moments, these final days of Ramadan. Make a lot of dua. Pour your heart out into dua. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you and to accept from you. Go back to the surah, review it one more time. Go back to your notes when you can, maybe after Ramadan. Share your notes with other people. Share these principles with other people. Do something creative with it, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, maybe put it up in your home somewhere. Share it on social media in a creative way so that others will benefit. These are principles we are in need of. And they have all been extracted from just one surah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the ICD and AMS. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from everyone who facilitated this. Allahumma ameen. Wa salli lahum ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.